to keep that hope and faith of knowing that if God gives you something to do, he's going to give you tools also. Welcome to Mamas in Spirit, a podcast pointing you towards God in everything you are and everything you do. I'm Lindy Wynn, and it's a blessing to be with you. It delights my heart and my soul every time we get to be together, that we are knit together as family and as sisters in Christ. And today we are blessed to be here with a glorious sister in Christ, Kariana Fry. Kariana, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Lindy. I'm so glad to be back with you again. We had such a great time last time, so I cannot wait to see how this conversation just flows. Yes, and whether appropriate or inappropriate, we did talk about what you say on your website about loving Jesus. I think then bourbon, then fries, in that order? Yes, in that order. (laughs) Yes, I've moved to Tennessee, and so there's much more bourbon and whiskey here. I just thought you should know. You know what? You really can't go wrong with a good bourbon. And I know that there are many of our sisters that do not imbibe in anything. But if you do look for a good bourbon, there's something that's really nice about that that smooth smokiness that a good bourbon will have. Yes. And <laughs> thankfully, um, Jesus is omnipresent. Jesus is everywhere. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, Kariana, I have had the blessing since we were together a couple years ago now to read one of your newest works that you've edited. We are beloved, 30 Days with Sister Thea Bowman. And I am so touched by this work. And I want to share just for a second why, because I think it's at the heart of the matter for our spirituality and for our faith. It talks about being God-aware, self-aware, and other-aware. And sometimes I wonder, I feel a little bit concerned with some books that maybe they're too self-focused without getting to the other, our call to give our lives fully as Christ shows us and as Christ is the ultimate example. And reading this book, not only does it touch directly upon that, but that's what these reflections do ultimately. It's that they're God aware, Thea is clearly Thea aware, (laughs) and then (laughs) aware of the other. And especially when we talk about the other, it's all of us as a family, like she talks about in her reflections in this book. But also other aware to those who are suffering and struggling and maybe being treated in ways that do not uphold their God-given value and dignity as human beings. And in Mamas in Spirit, that's so important to me. It, it refreshed me in that reading this and spending time with her. It's like, this is what I'm so passionate about. This is what I really care about is that we leave these times together more filled to love and to Mm -hmm. serve. And so I just want to thank you for the work that you're doing and who you are, because I just think that it's so important. Well, thank you. Yeah. And I do love that, that idea about being God aware, self aware and others, because I think we, we typically will have the God aware part really down pat. We're good at that part. Self aware, there's become more of an embrace of really becoming and understanding who you are and, and where you fit in as far as your, you know, our place in the space. But then when we have to go a little bit further and be other aware, that's where I think we tend to be more hesitant because quite often when we start looking about and caring about others, we are called to become a little bit uncomfortable. We're actually called to give of ourselves. And I think that is where we can sometimes put up a little personal barrier, almost like a protective barrier of, okay, God, I want to, but I don't want to get hurt or I don't know what to do. I don't want to do the wrong thing. And so because we want to be self-protective, we end up not doing anything. And I think that once we can move past this idea of you might get hurt and that's okay because God is going to be there to catch you. And we don't want to let fear be the ruler and the decision maker in our lives. That's something that will keep us from being self-aware and aware of others and their needs. Yes. And, and, Thea talks about this in the book, since you pulled from many of her different speeches and writings and things of the sort, she talks about being love-based and not fear-based, which is exactly what you're touching upon. And I loved your Instagram post on MLK Day because you talked about us getting uncomfortable. In the end of it, you said, ignorance is bliss and ignorance is comfortable. Today, choose to learn something new, even if it means getting a little uncomfortable. And kind of even going further with that maybe is truly loving and truly giving of our lives is uncomfortable, but that's how we learn. That's how we learn 
of God's love and and Christ's love is by truly engaging with a cross, by by essentially even at times choosing discomfort, choosing even more so suffering in order to love another. So in that spirit, in the Holy Spirit, I'd love for us to begin in prayer. And I'd like to use one of the prayers, and I'm going to be reading it because I have the book in front of me. <laughs> Kariana has it in her heart and soul. <laughs> And somewhere else in my house, so. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, I would love to hear you read it. <laughs> somewhere in our heart, soul, and somewhere else in our house. <laughs> That's so awesome. So I'm going to be reading from day five, My Day Begins. Some of us are poor. Some of us have not had the advantages of education. But how can people still have a voice and a role in the work of the church? Isn't that what the church is calling us all to? We're called to walk together in a new way toward that land of promise and to celebrate who we are and whose we are. If we as a church walk together, don't let nobody separate you. The church teaches us that the church is family. It is a family of families and the family got to stay together. We know that if we do stay together, if we walk and talk and work, and play, and stand together in Jesus' name, will be who we say we are, truly Catholic, and we shall overcome. Amen. Amen. So many words of wisdom, of great wisdom in this book, Kariana. And in light of Thea Bowman, and also in light of your beautiful heart, Kariana, on your website, you say that you love to share your story as a Black Catholic woman. And I really want to dig deeper this time. I, I want to know your story. I want to know you and and that piece of your story that you love sharing so much. I think it really comes down to this almost having each foot in a different identity. And, I, and I'm not going to speak for every Black Catholic out there because I cannot. I can only speak for myself and from my experience. And it's one where what I really want to embrace and to encourage others is that being Catholic is a universal calling, but it does not mean that you have to only be one kind of Catholic. So what what do you exactly mean by that? So I had converted to Catholicism when I was 20. I was a junior in college. I was at the University of Wisconsin, and I grew up Baptist. So I grew up in a wonderful, it was a missionary Baptist church filled with gospel music, and it was such a God-filled, spirit-filled place. But by age, I found there was just something, something kind of missing from all that. And so I went on a little bit of a spiritual journey over a couple of years, and I you know, checked out a couple of evangelical churches, and I, I had a lot of friends that were Lutheran, so I'd go with them to church, and I would start researching a little bit into uh, Judaism and other, other world religions. I was really looking at everything except for Catholicism because of what I thought the Catholic Church stood for and what it was. And for me, it was a big thing about, you know, Catholic Church does not respect women and it does this and it does that. All things that if you don't know anything about the church, you tend to kind of believe because that's what everyone says. And then as I started speaking to some more people, I started going to the Neumann Center on our campus and just meeting actual Catholics and talking with them about their faith and what their faith stood for. I discovered that is what I was missing. Um, and in really in particular, it was Jesus in the Eucharist that was missing. So this idea that at every single mass throughout the world, that the bread and the wine become the real presence and that we are tangibly able to not only consume Christ and, and have him come into us, that we become living tabernacles as we walk out into the world. So I was missing that part. I mean, that, that's really down home spirituality right there, that we are called to be Christ's hands and feet because we have him dwelling within us. And so I converted in the early 2000s and really dove into just try to learn as much as I can about the church. And as I did, I found myself almost losing part of my own personal identity because I was trying to become the perfect Catholic which does not exist. <laughs> and I'm sure some of you listening probably have experienced that also. If only I do this right. If only I can get this one. If I, I have to veil, I have to make sure that I am following every single tenant letter of the law. And then we forget that that is exactly why Christ came here. He came to be the fulfillment of the law. So that way we're not checking off boxes to say, well, 
I am a good Catholic or I am a good Christian or I am a good whatever because I have checked off all these boxes. Christ came in the form of a, of a child because he came to love. And babies, that's all they know. Babies just know love and, and eating and pooping. But they also know how to love. That's all they know how to do. And, and I think that we forget this. We think that if we do everything that we're supposed to do, then we will get that fast pass to heaven and things will be great. But then how are we any different from the the Pharisee and the text collector in that wonderful parable of Pharisee is there talking about how awesome he is and how he does all their things right. And he's following every one of those 613 commandments. And then you got the tax collector saying, you know what, God, I am screwed up. I'm a terrible person. And here I am. You know, and I think that when we become so focused on trying to be the best version of one aspect of ourselves, we lose the other part. So I found that I was losing who I was as a mixed race. I'm, I'm actually a mixed race American. My father is of German descent and my mother was of, of black descent. My mother passed away about 10 years ago. So hence the past tense there. But it's one where growing up as a mixed race individual, there was a constant refrain of well, what side are you really? What team do you belong to or or who are you most connected with? And then I found that same thing when I came into the church. If I was going to be truly Catholic, I had to make sure I did all of these things right. But then how does, does that end up taking away from who I am as a biracial American? And it kind of came to a head of, of reckoning of it can be both that it doesn't have to be either or just because I am a Catholic American does not mean that I am not a biracial American. And so it means that I, I can be both and I should be both. And we are all called to be both. I like to say that Catholic does tend to kind of trump a little bit because it's like, it's the bigger one, but that's what our church is made of. Our church is this beautiful, diverse conglomerate of people that are not called to forget who they are culturally, but to bring in those cultural aspects that make each of our wonderful cultures the way they are and to see how they all fit together as under that big, broad Catholic umbrella. Yes. And what you're saying is also something that I read in this work where there is a part about, I'm actually going to read a little bit. I found it. Must be the Holy (laughs) Spirit. We are not all alike. Emphatically, no. We do not look alike. We do not sing, dance, pray, play, think, cook, eat, wash, clean, chew, laugh, dress, or spit alike. Asians are not like Europeans, are not like Africans. Irish are not like Italians, are not like French. Africans are not like Afro-Americans. Black folks are not alike. Folks from Louisiana are not like any other people in the world. (laughs) Praise the Lord, we are not alike. If I begin to believe that we are all alike, look at what I'm going to miss the richness, beauty, wholeness, and harmony of what God created. Kariana, can you share with us from your experience? Because like you said, and I read this in another work that I think that you've done, that it's important not to take one person's experience and then put that on everybody else that seems to have things in common, whether it's culture or race or anything else. So just from your specific experience, can you share about the richness that you've been blessed with? Like, Do you have any stories or any moments that really come to heart and mind that are like richness that you don't want to leave behind. Like when you talked about trying to check off the boxes, you felt like you were leaving things behind. So what is that? What is that for you? For me, unequivocally, it is music. Our family is very musically inclined, if I can say so myself. We love music. And for me, that really was kind of a point where I felt that if I'm going to become Catholic, that means I have to leave behind my love of gospel music and the roots that gospel music has in my family. My aunts are amazing singers and they've been members of church choirs as long as I can remember. I grew up in church choirs and there is just something very different about gospel music. If you've ever listened to it, you know, it's, it can be very soul stirring and it's convicting. And I felt that if I became Catholic, I would have to leave that behind. Because if I was going to be a good Catholic and everything else, I would have to make sure I'm only listening to 
Gregorian chant and I'm making sure that I'm only listening to polyphonic rhythms and harmonies and that it has to be done in in Latin. These are all things that I did really truly believe that if I was truly going to be Catholic, that means I had to make sure that I'm doing everything that in my head it meant to be Catholic. And so it meant no contemporary music. It meant no no gospel music for sure. And that really felt like letting go a piece of me because that music is what I grew up. I grew up with, with gospel music on the radio all the time, especially when I was with my family and having these old spirituals that would be sung or just hummed throughout the house to feel that I had to give that up in order to be part of this other group was first of all erroneous, of course, but it was really something that made me wonder, is this what Christ is calling me to do? Or is it something that maybe society is saying that you can do? And I think we need to remember those of us who are part of the Roman right, that our church is very based in European traditions as far as the Roman church goes. It's not limited to just Rome, that a, a mass is still going to be valid and it's still going to be reverent. If you happen to have drums and tambourines versus just a beautiful organ and that we have to make sure that we have room for everyone to be able to worship and not just say you have to worship in this particular way. So to personalize that a little bit more, and thank you for sharing all of that, did you feel like there was a part of you that you had to let go because it wasn't good enough per se, or it wasn't holy enough? Because you're a very contemplative person. And so in your own heart and in your own soul, it sounds like you were grappling or struggling to really reconcile something in your soul. Because a lot of these thoughts, I think, keep us from our souls. Like you talked about the soul and you talked about richness and you talked about depth. But a lot of these types of thoughts can keep us really Mm -hmm. from God and keep us from going there. How did you reconcile that? And how did you dig deep within yourself and your own prayer life? What did God reveal to you? I think that's where a lot of the contemplative part of me comes from is really internalizing and taking things to God. So in, in, in addition to growing up with wonderful music, I grew up with the idea that, you know, whatever your needs are, you take them to God. If you're having a bad day, take it to God. If you're having a great day, take it to God. <laughs> it was a great way to grow up because you always knew that God was going to be there. And I just remember spending time in adoration. I'm a, I'm a big fan of adoration. I've not gone in a while. I will admit that, but I'm a big fan. And I would always go with a notebook because I would actually have a wonderful conversation with Christ in adoration. And this is going to sound probably bonkers to some of you, but it's all right. It can sound bonkers to you. It's okay. But I would take my my notebook and I would just sit in an adoration. I would just kind of just be present. And then I would start to write. I'd write a statement or question and then I would pause. And then I would start writing again. And this is where the bonkers part will come in. The handwriting would be slightly changed. And it would basically be this conversation where I would write a question or I would just tell Jesus something and he would respond in words. And, you know, when I look back at these journals, these adoration journals, it is amazing how the common thread that would that would wind through was this idea of there is no such thing as enough because Christ is enough. So when we start saying to ourselves, I'm not Catholic enough, or I'm not fit enough, that there will never be enough that we're trying to do because Christ is the enough that we're looking for. So we're constantly searching for something that's right there, but we're not able to see it. So in those adoration sessions, those moments of peace and calm is where I started to really come and reconcile that God created our world for diversity. He created us very differently because that's what he wanted us to be. If he wanted all of us to look the same and sound the same and act the same, he would have done that because he is the creator, but he didn't. And he filled us also with curiosity. And then I think that we need to really come back and embrace that curiosity for one another and ask questions and understand that maybe when you ask a question, someone may not want to answer the question, But at least you have asked, you've opened up that door and you've stepped forward to say, help me understand. And I think that that's really where we can move forward is the idea of seeking for understanding rather than trying to be understood, which is part of the St. Francis Peace Prayer, which is actually one of my absolute favorite prayers out there. (laughs) Yes, a very, very beautiful prayer. And what I'm hearing from you, Carrie, I think at the heart of it is very much 
something that I think we can all relate to. And this is a Lenten podcast. And this is a beautiful invitation with adoration too that you're giving us is that you saw all these things that you thought you perceived from your own human perception that I need to check off these boxes in order to essentially be good enough or to fit in or or to be loved. uh, That's uh, really what it comes down to, to be loved. I love that you said that. It's very beautiful. And I imagine that that resonates with all of our hearts, that you felt like you had to check off all these boxes in order to be loved. I'm going to say that again because I think that we all probably do that. Mm -hmm. You felt like you had to check off all these boxes in order to be loved. And I wonder in each one of our hearts, all of us listening right now, whoever in this very moment is listening, what in each of our hearts do we think we have to check off? What boxes do we have to check off in order to be loved? Because really there is no checklist. There is no checklist with the Lord. And so coming from being biracial, coming from these different experiences that you had growing up, but yet finding truth in the Catholic Church and choosing the Catholic Church, you felt like you had to let go of things and ultimately things that were treasures to you and very much reflective of the love of the Lord and the goodness Mm -hmm. of the Lord. And so how beautiful and glorious that God revealed that to you in adoration. In scripture, it says God speaks to us in whispers. God speaks to us in the silence. Close our doors. Be with the Lord. Be with the Lord in silence. You're giving us a, a really glorious invitation this Lenten season, but always to sit with the Lord because we can all look at one another perceiving things on a very external way, but yet all of our souls are different yet combined together in Jesus's heart, in the soul of the Lord per se, all together as one family. And we're all different. And God wants to speak into each one of our hearts, into each one of us personally and intimately. And you spoke specifically about humming Mm-hmm. And there was a reflection that actually I think is honestly my favorite reflection in this book. And it's actually near mm-hmm. the end. And it's my people used to say and still say, sometimes you have to moan. I remember old people sitting out on their porches. And of course, I love this because I live in Tennessee, everyone now, and I have a porch <laughs> with a rocking chair and moaning on and on in a kind of deep melodic hum. I found that moaning is therapeutic. It's a way of centering the way you do in centering prayer. Old people used to say the words from scripture, when we don't know how to pray, the spirit intercedes for us with inexpressible groaning. So it talks about moaning and groaning and humming in here too, Mm -hmm. as it goes on and singing. And it says in the end, it's a lesson I learned from my people and my heritage. And what I'm hearing from you, correct me if I'm wrong, is that very much lives on in your own heart and soul. Right. Yeah. I mean, that that's, I think music is something that can really cross cultures and, and intertwine us if we allow it. If you listen to contemporary Christian music, you may find yourself singing along. And because so many of the songs are based in Psalms, especially, um, you're praying as you're going along. And so we tend to want to uh, put things into buckets, like this is my prayer time and this is my worship time. But what if your entire life was a method of worship because of your song throughout the day? How would that change your life? Yes. And what I'm hearing from you is don't limit the Lord. Oh, no. Don't limit limit God. No, no, no. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And and yes. And that that God reveals God's self to us in in ways that are are surprising and unexpected and all day long. Mm -hmm. And to not to not compartmentalize God into once again, boxes. I guess we have a theme here. (laughs) Don't don't limit God to boxes. And I wonder too, Kariana, I wonder what you think about this. But one of the things that I, I witness at times is I think that God gets limited out of fear. And that kind of goes back to your story of coming into the Catholic Church, like fear and guilt, which Father John Meyer and I have a podcast in this Lenten series about shame, because shame is at the heart of that. Mm -hmm. And that sense of not being lovable or not having dignity or not having value or being afraid of not being lovable, but that somehow the guilt or shame that they don't fall into just this box that's been created even sometimes by others, Mm -hmm. but that God is much greater than that. Yes. We tend to forget that God is much more powerful than any of us. And he already knows our our story and he knows the path that he's laid out for us. And 
sometimes we really do have to let go and let God do his work within us, even if it makes you uncomfortable. So when you feel that the Holy Spirit encourage you to do something, maybe someone mentions a book or an article that you should read just to get a new perspective. And you're thinking, I don't want to, because it's much easier to remain in the dark. It's much easier to remain ignorant to the plight of others, because then you don't have to do anything. But as soon as you have that little crack of light that says, these are what your brothers and sisters are undergoing right now, what are you going to do about it? And maybe that does end up just being praying for clarity or praying for wisdom. But sometimes God will give you something to do. And then you're not going to want to do it because it's hard. (laughs) And that's when you really have to do it. I like the, the, the thought, God will never give you anything that you can't handle. But I, I really think it really is more that God will never give you anything that he cannot handle. If God's going to give you a task, he's going to give you the tools to do that task. So just keep that hope and faith of knowing that if God gives you something to do, he's going to give you tools also. He's not going to, he's not going to let, let you up there and, and say, all right, go for it and find your tools. <laughs> Yes. And that's very much a full circle moment too, to that's where we learn the love of God. That's where God reveals God's self to us. Kind of going to this whole idea of not boxing God in, like one of the greatest experiences in my life of of learning the love of God is loving my children mm-hmm. and being an adoptive mother and and all the different trials and, and circumstances that we faced. That's where I've really learned what the love of God is, what the life of Christ is, through those deeply personal experiences and saying yes to things that were so much bigger than me. Because I also like to think that like when you were talking about like God doesn't give us things that we can't handle, it's like, I, I don't even know how much I can really handle, but God can handle everything. Right. <laughs> so you said let go. So so it's that surrender. But we like to control. We like our boxes. Mm-hmm. So this is a beautiful invitation for this Lenten season for us to examine what are my boxes? How am I boxing God in? How am I boxing God's love for me in? And how can I release both of those fully so that I can rest and love more as God calls me? Thank you, Kiriana. This is so beautiful. And I'm wondering, is there anything else from our conversation and just from editing this work, from what you've written yourself, from all the work you do, is there anything else that you want to share with listeners? I think that the, the biggest thing is came back into my life recently. Um, some of you may be like me and you're big fans of the show Ted Lasso. If you have not watched Ted Lasso yet, I will have to say you should really watch it. There is some language that's so not really good for like kids, but I really wish they didn't, they didn't have language because it's such a great message behind it. But uh, in one of the episodes, Ted quotes Walt Whitman, and he says, be curious, not judgmental. And then it's, 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 there's a whole reason why he says this. But this phrasing kind of has been staying with me for the last couple of days of being curious, not judgmental, because I wonder how much of our misunderstandings as a society and as a culture and as a people could be alleviated if we were more curious about somebody. If we said, you know what, I don't understand X, Y, and Z. Can you help me understand? And so since this is a a Linton podcast, I would encourage everyone here to take a moment in your day for curiosity and find something that you can be curious about and explore that curiosity. Be like a kid again. Try to dispel that fear of rejection and reach out to find something that you're not quite understanding and seek for that understanding. Because I think that is really what has been lacking in the over the last couple years, months, time immortal, is the willingness to say, I don't understand. Can you help me understand? I don't understand. Can you help me understand? I love that. And that is so much at the heart of Mamas in Spirit and why we're all here together is to listen to the stories of so many and not to box people in, not to box people in by anything, including politics, everybody. Amen. Everything. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> but to listen, to listen way, way beneath the layers to to the level of the soul. That's the hope is to to reveal souls and stories so that we can heal. And we can walk forward together, like going back to this this book and Thea's message on us being family, which is really Christ's message, which is really God's message. Thank you so much. And carry on. And now I'm asking everybody, do you have a favorite saint? I have a lot of favorite saints. <laughs> I would like narrow them. Or you could talk about Sister I Thea, find- because I know that 
this has been opened. Yes. So yes. So she is her, her cause has been open for canonization. So she is definitely one of, one of my St. Friends. I also, you know, I, I mentioned a little bit about St. Francis earlier because I just feel like he's, I'm a peacemaker. I do strive to try to find that, you know, that middle ground. I'm a big fan of the both and so speaking understanding, but we also recently uh, celebrated St. Josephine Bakita, who um, I think for her, forgiveness comes to mind for her and her story of, you know, being, being enslaved and then being held in captivity and being abused and just to have that heart of forgiveness when all was said and done. So uh, those are probably my, off the top of my head, probably my three that I would mention today. But if you ask me tomorrow, it might be somebody different. And that's what I love about our faith. All of these saint friends that can come to our, our aid and walk with us no matter where we are in life at that point. <laughs> Yes, yes. And how about, do you have a favorite scripture passage or prayer? I know you already mentioned St. Francis's prayer. Yes, uh, St. Francis's prayer. But I will also say, now, it's going to sound familiar to many of you. I do love Psalm 4610, so be still and know that I am God. But I don't love it just for that verse. I actually love that entire psalm because if you read that psalm, and then I've been this month before somewhere else, I will admit, that psalm is not a very, you know, it's not a very peaceful psalm. It's actually a psalm about, about war and strife. And that that verse forty six ten is not God coming as a whisper. You know, Be still and know that I am God. He is walking into the scene and commanding stillness. He is co- he is coming forward in all of his glory in that verse. So I encourage you to not just read forty six ten. Don't just it's very common to have it on wood placards and pillows, but read the entire <laughs> psalm and it is so amazingly powerful when you read that because you know that God is fully in control and do not mess with our God. (laughs) Yes. And what a beautiful invitation. We all know what the chaos in each one of our own hearts or lives is right now, and that God wants to be in us and to be still with us in that. Right back to your example of adoration. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. And Kariana, would you be open to closing us in prayer? Of course, I would love to. Join me in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father God, we are grateful to be gathered here across time and across space with you. Lord, help us to learn a little bit more about your love for us by the way that we love others. Help us to always strive for curiosity and understanding. Help us to really truly be the hands and feet of your beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to go out there and to change the world one person at a time. And Lord, if it, if it means that we have to be a little bit more uncomfortable, help us to work to make someone else in our lives more comfortable. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kariana, for that invitation for us to enter more into what is uncomfortable for us. May, no matter how we're feeling, may we encounter and love into and learn about all the souls that we meet. May we be present and mindful of that to to meet one another at the heart and soul of who each one of us are. Thank you everyone so much for being here for this Lenten podcast. And just so you know, there are videos now of these podcasts on YouTube if you want to head over there. (laughs) Kariana is waving to you. Yes, yes, we've, we've grown here. We're now doing video. And there are also many more faithful podcasts at mamasandspirit.com as well as wherever you listen to podcasts. And also know you can always reach out for prayers, always for prayers. We have you on our hearts. We have this community in our prayers, and we want you to know that you are personally loved and cared for. Can't wait to be together again next time. This is Lindy Wynn with Mamas in Spirit. May God bless you and yours always. Always.